the faces in the room and have this excellent panel here. We're going to do a session on self-regulation, yes or no. We put it a bit provocative so that actually we said there's no cyber security without government regulation. And last year the NLIGF did a panel on critical infrastructure incidents and, and, and uh, the reporting thereof and uh, cooperation. And the panel we had last year actually gave eight or nine recommendations, which we thought, well, two are very interesting to pick up for 2013. We're going to do another session this afternoon on breaking down silos and exchanging information. And the other recommendation was, if there's a, we talk about critical infrastructure incidents, then we have to talk about self-regulation. And then we ask ourselves, what is self-regulation? Is it actually happening? Who is self-regulating themselves and in which way? Do other parties know enough about this self-regulation and are these self-regulations implemented by the people who should be implementing them and the companies that should be implementing them? And if not, is there some way that other affiliations could assist with these implementations? So from there we went to organizing a panel. We tried to make that as broad as possible. We unfortunately had one cancellation, but that can happen. In the pan panel we have Apinar Swinda from Google. So welcome. We have Nina Janssen from the Dutch Ministry of Security and Justice. We have Astrid Altenbrugge from the, 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 the Parliament of the Netherlands of the Social Democratic Party. We have Liesel Frans of the State Department in the US. And some of them from the Internet Engineering Task Force that he represents here today. There's Sil Sylvia, now to Visa Conte, sorry, from the DG Connect in the International Department of the European Commission. And we have Vir Virgilio Almeida, who is the National Secretary for Information Technology Policies of Brazil. So, very welcome. And we're going to start with one question. When we talk about cybersecurity, do we need regulation or do we need self-regulation? Yes or no? Strictly yes or no answer. Uh, well, but I feel like you haven't framed the question properly then, because it's either self-regulation or... So I would say yes to self-regulation um, and regulation, depending on what it looks like, could either be helpful or harmful. Thank you. One zero. Okay, so Nina Janssen from the Ministry of Security and Justice in the Netherlands. We aren't so much talking about uh, regulation or not. There are several forms of regulation if you look at it from different perspectives. You have self-regulation, but you also have a lot of, um, uh, you have uh, several notification procedures which already apply offline and do apply online as well. There is government uh, individual legislation, look at criminal legislation, and we have international law, human rights, which is a form of regulation as well. So I would definitely see, say yes to Regulation is necessary for cybersecurity. That was a long yes, but it's one to one. Uh, well, uh, I think it should be both self regulation and. Okay. It's not a question about or, it's and. One and a half, one and a half. I think I have to go with the, the both with an emphasis on uh, self regulation except when absolutely, absolutely needed and only when well deliberated to, de to make that determination. Okay, I'm going to say self-regulation to make it easy. Two and a half and one and a half. So if I have to pick, I'm going to fall the same way. I think self-regulation is the answer. Three and a half, one and a half. <laughs> okay, I'll try and balance the score. Yes to regulation. Um, <laughs> I, I think uh, cybersecurity is like uh, any other area of uh, public life. Uh, it, it's impossible to deal completely without regulation. Well, uh, my answer is a true yes. <laughs> I think that there is need for government regulation and uh, there is uh, also uh, a space and room for self-regulation. Uh, actually, we can frame the, the, this question in another 
in a different way. It's a government and most stakeholder roles in cybersecurity. I have both. I think that both have very important roles in cybersecurity. And later on, I can give some examples of that. Right, thank you. I think self-regulation wins with uh, something like a nail. But here in the room, what do you think? Self-regulation is prevalent on cybersecurity, or regulation is prevalent. Just show hands for self-regulation. That's the, that's the third option. But first, self-regulation. Purely for self-regulation. Purely self-regulation. That's not a lot. Purely regulation. It seems to be even. Who is for both? That seems to win, and, it's, and that is just about the same in the panel, as we noticed. So that's at least a start for this discussion, because I think that it shows that maybe we should be discussing both, and it's not a black and white issue. Um, let's start first with the Brazilian government. You've been making a lot of proposals since the, the wicked, we understand. And how do these proposals reflect the discussion on self-regulation or regulation? Okay, uh, let me first make some comments to give a context for, the, for my, 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 my position. So we are talking about cybersecurity, which is clearly an asymmetric enterprise. So we are talking about an, a, an activity where defenders are reactive and attackers are proactive. We are talking about an environment well, defense is expensive and attacks are cheap. Uh, we, we are talking about an environment where uh, uh, defense is based on past attacks, but every day you have a new type of attack. So we need something else. So I think that uh, governments and most stakeholders have a very important role in, uh, in uh, 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 working towards a, a more safe cyberspace. Uh, the role of government is essential because we are talking about something that needs a lot of science and technology and that demands investments. So government, governments have to invest in research and development to come up with new tools, new technologies that uh, will uh, uh, prevent future attacks. So that, that's the first point. We need investments for that. Second point, we need uh, economic and regulatory incentives so that companies can help the society, government, to create a safer uh, cyberspace. But uh, the, uh, the role of most stakeholder model it's really important for this let uh, let us compare this to to the offline world when you think about a neighborhood if you want to increase uh, uh, the safety of a certain neighborhood what you do you count on the police but you can't count on the population there you depend on the people that live in that area so it, it's 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 clear combination of community, and government. So the same thing happens in the cyberspace. We need civil society, we need private sector, and we need government. Let me give an example of that. Uh, gov gov government ha has an important uh, role of proposing and implementing policies for cybersecurity. But this policy-making process is also, uh, 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 can also benefit from different uh, views from the, the civil society in order to construct a better, be, better uh, legislation for that. So that's another importance for the mode stakeholder model. Uh, the implementation of, of, of the Legislation and policy also depends on, 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 on the, on the uh, 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 support of the private sector companies, and we can see that. Uh, uh, let me give an example. In Brazil, we have the 
the Internet Steering Committee that has a very nice example of how things work uh, in, in this remote stakeholder model. The Internet Steering Committee did a study to understand spam in Brazil. And Brazil was one of the uh, top five countries in producing spam uh, two years ago. After this study done by the, 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 steering, the Brazilian Steering Committee, which is a, a multi-stakeholder committee, uh, the, the, the solution proposed was to, to do some special management of gate of the, of the port 25 of, of the systems. It's a technical question in order to reduce uh, spam emission. And Brazil now is in the 20th position of the rank of countries that produce uh, spam. So that was uh, achieved by the participation of the civil society, members in the, in the steering committee, the companies that adopted the suggestion is not, is not a regulatory, but it's, it's, it's a, a best practice, and that worked well. So these are examples of the importance of, the, of, of both bodies, government and uh, uh, most stakeholder uh, participants. Thank you. I think that's a very clear example how people work together that can actually make a difference and made a difference in this example of pushing spam down. Then, for the other government rep representatives, what are your concerns towards cyber security in general? So what is actually keeping you awake at night as a government representative and not as a private person, I hope. Um, to start with the European Commission. Sure. Um, first of all, I think what, what keeps us awake at night is, is instead very much what keeps citizens up at night. So it's whether they are... Um, their online operations are safe, whether their financial data is safe, whether their, uh, um, you know, the, the, the systems operating um, energy transmission are working, uh, whether safety measures that make trains uh, avoid collisions are working. All this runs through the Internet these days. So um, I think uh, I, I don't see a big, um, a big difference with the Internet with any other... Um, means or tool or, or, um, that, or good in general that permeates public life. So I, don't, I think we need to start, uh, first of all, stop uh, looking at Internet as something exceptional. It's not anymore. It, it really goes into every um, aspect of public life, and as such, there are, there's, uh, there's, uh, there's a moment where the government uh, or different regulatory authorities intervene, have to intervene, um, in the remit of their responsibility, and only in the remit of their responsibility, and that's why then we, we th I think we, we end up with something that is a mix between regulation, self-regulation, uh, and, and different tools. So, indeed, what keeps us up at night, as I said, things uh, that the banking sector is running, that the stock exchange doesn't, doesn't collapse, uh, um, that uh, electronic medical devices are working in, in hospitals, so anything that relies on the Internet, really. Um, as, as some of you may or may not know, Europe is uh, the way it is, it is, um, it is. it is conceived. It is made up. The European Commission covers uh, what is the uh, community remit. So part of the public policy is um, initiated at the European Commission. Much of that has to do with cybersecurity is actually in the remit of um, of our member states. So in that, by definition, we work in a in a multi-stakeholder way. Um, just one uh, concrete example from my side. Uh, we have, the European Commission has put out a proposal for legislation um, in the cybersecurity area to introduce a minimum um, requirement that when there are um, cybersecurity uh, incidents in, uh, in critical areas of um, of the infrastructure, these be reported. At the moment, the, the, ru the rules in Europe just say only if telecom companies have some kind of breach of security. With this legislation, we are going to extend it to other critical areas, indeed, uh, banking sector, energy, transport, health, and some areas of the public administration. So as you see, just minimum standards, and then we can work on self-regulation as well. And one question. Yeah. The remit of government of the, of the EU Commission, what is, do you think, your remit? 
Well, um, things that affect the internal market, for example, that would be within um, the Commission's remit. But there are things that relate to, uh, for example, national security. National security remains with member states at the moment, so that this is not something we deal with directly. And then we'll pass a question to, to Liesel or to Nina. What is the remit of a national government when cybersecurity is concerned? Well, certainly um, there is a, a, a care of the citizenry of the, of the country that, the, that is a role for government. But I think that that can take many, many forms. I don't think strictly or purely regulation is the only way to do it. So I think there are alternative ways to... Um, to realize that role, um, such as a convening function, um, providing uh, incentives for um, action, um, being sure to in, in, uh, partake in consult consultations, as Rogelio said, um, in a multi-stakeholder way, getting input from people that are either going to be impact or can help impact the outcome, impacted by or help, in, or help impact the outcome. Um, I think that looking at how to Make sure your legal framework um, has the appropriate laws for uh, criminalizing activity that allows for redress that way when something has gone wrong. And then I think one of the key roles for government is as a partner um, in public-private partnership efforts. And all of those functions that a government undertakes um, move industry and move um, um, participants in this uh, internet life we have to, to, to take action. I, I even uh, I left out you know, helping to build awareness, not only of citizens, but also of enterprises and organizations of any kind. So um, I, I would put it as an active participant and a partner um, in moving a large, <laughs> uh, you know, a large constituency and affecting change. One thing I'd like to say about, um, uh, elaborate a little bit on in my not so quick answer to the, to the first question, well, is that I think we also need to look at regulation or as, as I prefer in this case to talk about legislation as not just mandates for, um, for prescriptive or uh, prescriptive requirements, but ways in which uh, you can enable public-private partnership, where you can enable com companies to take action. One way in which that has manifested in the U.S. is there are very, um, uh, there are several impediments to the ability for government and industry to share information with each other. So is there a way to enact legislation that allows for m more um, companies and government to share information more easily, more easily so that they have, we all have better situational awareness about what's happening. I think what keeps um, government up at night, as Sylvia said, is pretty much anything that can go wrong. Um, recently, uh, you know, my White House leadership characterized the current environment in which one in which cybersecurity threats are increasingly broader, sophisticated, and dangerous. They include persistent intrusions, um, theft of business information, degradation or denial of service to legitimate entities trying to do their business or get their message out. Um, so that's kind of a scary um, environment to be looking at. But I think one key element of any of those is something that um, we haven't been able to detect. Thank you, Liesl. And Nina, you're... Ministry is even wider, it's security and justice, so that's a lot wider. So there must be a lot more that keeps you awake at night. Well, a lot more? I, I wouldn't... Well, as a, as a policymaker, you're, you're always um, uh, weighing interests and, and looking, gathering input. So I would agree with Liesl that you're looking for uh, the partners, the, the, the methods and, and the means that are available to um, yeah, address the different interests at the table, so to say. So it's not so, something that, uh, that keeps me awake at night, because then I wouldn't sleep, because it's my <laughs> work. <laughs> but uh, I guess that the dilemmas that we are faced with, with uh, from the, um, the governmental viewpoint is how do you weigh the, 
uh, interests that should be taken into account and treated equally. Um, what extent of security, because I don't think that there is absolute security, it's neither um, possible nor desirable, I think. So, so what extent of that security should, be, uh, should we want is desirable if you set it against um, usability or the openness of, uh, uh, of the Internet, and so what consequences would a certain measure have? Uh, what extent of freedom online is desirable if you set it against threats or crime that actually comes with certain free uh, opportunities? Uh, and how do you again ex react against such threats or the crime itself? Should we only be able to react defensively? Or is there a, an, uh, should we be able to act in return or not? Uh, so the interests that you are talking or that you're Regarding as a government, they are uh, they are quite broad. You look at industry, uh, you look at the small players in the field that maybe not have such a very strong voice. Uh, individual consumers, human rights defenders, uh, individuals' privacy rights, um, commercial interests—they all should be taken into account when you make policy. And if you decide to regulate, they should be taken into account in that legislative procedure. Uh, what we've experienced in the Netherlands in 2011 was a cybersecurity incident or actually it evolved into a crisis where a relatively small certificate provider called DigiNotar, uh, they were hacked and uh, they had quite some, this, in, this crisis was, a, was actually quite a wake-up call for uh, politicians, for uh, government, for um, industry players as well. And uh, parliaments realized that certain services uh, are uh, should be considered a critical infrastructure or a vital sector, so they demanded a security breach notification. We've recently tabled this security breach notification proposal to Parliament, and I think this is one of the regulatory measures that you can take if they're uh, set in the correct fashion. And what I mean with the correct fashion is, for example, we also would like to get the information uh, that we need at the table, so we don't want to frighten off anyone. Uh, this notification concerns, therefore, uh, only the vital infrastructure and uh, information that actually influences our national security. Uh, and we also chose not, at least at this point in time yet, we chose not to sanction because uh, these partners share a lot of information with us already on a voluntary basis and we want them to keep sharing that information because it helps us assess trends and see uh, emerging threats or anything that may actually also uh, influence that national security. So it's currently this proposal is in the consultation process. There are uh, every stakeholder from an individual to uh, NGO or um, uh, industry players can uh, yeah, provide their input at this moment. Um, it's not finished yet, but it's one of the examples I think that we, where we have balanced those interests and are looking uh, for the way forward. Okay, thank you. Um, I would have loved to pass this question on to Etno as the, the representative of the European Telecommunications Organization, but unfortunately they counsel. I think that Google could be seen as something like an, uh, a vital and critical infrastructure because if Google goes down, we don't know anything anymore in this world. <laughs> what if, let's pretend that yeah, hypothetical, a major hack takes place at Google. We can't use Google anymore to find our information, and you're obliged to bring that to an institution, in this case in the Netherlands, that you have to report to. How would you look at that sort of obligation, and is that something which you could actually work with? Well, I'm not familiar with the specifics of the uh, obligation, so I probably shouldn't comment directly on that. Um, but what I can say is, you know, we take our, you sort of asked the initial question, what keeps you up at night? And I think in our organization, the security of our users' data and the security of our systems is, is something that keeps us up at night, right? We recognize that it's an arms race and the people who want to get into our systems are continually improving and they're continually getting smarter and faster and we need to improve at a same rate or ideally a faster rate 
Um, so I think, you know, in the context of sharing information, we can do that, but we are very wary of sharing information that will give anyone the ability to have enough knowledge to perpetrate an attack on our systems. Um, so it sort of depends kind of what exactly the parameters of any sharing would look like. I will say um, we have been fairly transparent about the, um, the fact that attacks do occur. Um, so, and I'll give you two ex examples. One is we were one of the first companies to step out and actively acknowledge that our systems had been targeted by um, attacks from China, not necessarily from the Chinese government, but from somewhere on in that region and in the territory. Um, and another example is, and a lot of companies do this now, is we have a program in which we act, we hold um, contests where we actively encourage users to hack Chrome, which is our browser. Um, and if you achieve a certain level of hacking through the contest, then there are certain cash prizes, and then that helps us understand better the vulnerabilities of our system and how to improve it. Yeah, that's a good example of self-regulation, I suppose, by trying to get people into your own system and inviting them to come into your system. Is there anybody from a vital infrastructure from Europe in the room? And do you dare to re respond to the proposals at this moment? No one? So via the critical infrastructure? Civil society is also vital infrastructure. I will mention that. Speaking of vital infrastructure, internet connectivity is also vital infrastructure. Yeah, I would just like to say uh, internet doesn't exist without us, so that the panel is perhaps not representing civil society. I think there's maybe a bit of a bias towards what, what vital infrastructures are on the internet. And I'm also quite concerned when governments are talking with corporations about data sharing and leaving us out of the equation, leaving oversight. I believe in the Northern Hemisphere, uh, the Northern Hemisphere there are already quite sinister data sharing programs between governments and corporations from what I've read recently in the papers. Thank you. My name is Alex Komninos. I'm with the internet. <laughs> that sounds good. <laughs> so there's no critical infrastructure representative in the room here. You, Bastian? <laughs> yeah, okay. So Bastian is with M6 in Amsterdam. So what about if you guys go down and you have to report? What happens? Uh, thanks, Wout, for introducing me. Indeed, I'm from uh, the Amsterdam uh, Internet Exchange, one of the, the big hubs, uh, internet hubs in the world, actually. Um, well, officially, we're not a uh, critical infrastructure, vital infrastructure, as we, as we say so in Holland. But um, obviously, at least from our perspective, we take uh, uh, the, our operations very, very seriously when it comes to uh, resilience, redundancy, the continuity of services, and along with that, security as well. By now, more than 600 uh, networks are uh, connected to our platform, and they are very keen on uh, the way uh, to see how we operate and that we report on that. So if we would be designated in um, Holland, in this case, as being critical infrastructure, which we do not think is necessary, but if that will be the case, of course, you know, we would abide by the law and uh, notify uh, security breaches. I have to say that um, maybe from a more public-private partnership perspective, although it's not like formalized, uh, we do have informal agreements with the Ministry of Econom Economic Affairs in this case, the ministry mainly responsible in Holland for um, telecom sector and also the internet. That if there anything happens, you know, we know where to find them. They can call our CEO, for instance, 24-7 in case of. So I think we have that part covered. And um, I don't think it would make a real difference. Also, you know, looking at what is in place for vital infrastructure in Holland, if we would be a critical infrastructure and we would notify, I don't think it would like improve our operations or really add something. Um, but at the same time, we are always open to discussions also with, with policy makers and we, we tend to see ourselves as completely transparent with regard to how we operate also technically. The only thing that we will not share is uh, like uh, customer info, customer data. We can always point people, look, this is a list on the website. These are all the customers. Contact details are there. If you have a particular question to an ISP or a content provider, well, I can invite you just to approach them personally, but that's about the only thing. For the rest, we are completely transparent. Everything is there. 
So I think we, uh, you yeah, know, that's about it. <laughs> Thank you. So um, let's go to the political side of the equation. Sorry? With somebody else? Okay. I don't see you. Sorry. Please introduce yourself. I'm, uh, I'm Nasak Teni. I'm the CTO for Microsoft in the Middle East and Africa. And to some extent, I would consider, you know, my company as uh, some of uh, running critical infrastructure as well in, in the world. I, I'd like to, to, to give two examples of, uh, you know, public partnerships and how um, uh, this can work. Um, and two examples of how our own experience. One is around how we actually work with certs, uh, you know, compu computer emergency response teams around the world around, and with information sharing because there is an opportunity for sharing information with certs um, around, uh, you know, threat intelligence and how that can help, you know, cooperation in terms of alerts and responses and, you know, uh, and, uh, and obviously uh, uh, cleaning computers, etc. So that's an area of, 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 of information sharing. I, I completely agree with what you said because we have the same concerns as, as Google. The other thing that I was an, an, an interesting experience for us is working with, with, uh, with law enforcement uh, agencies and so forth in areas of botnets. Um, you know, I don't want to go into the details of how botnets work, but basically uh, we, we have been able to to detect botnets and, and the technology in order to, to address and take, you know, the command and servers um, uh, down, but that required collaboration with law enforcement agencies so we can take orders immediately uh, from courts and go and, 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 you know, take down those botnets and, and address some of the major malware issues that were running in the industry. So there are areas of corporation and information sharing where we you know, we take action to, to make the Internet safer. Thank you. And we have Microsoft on our second panel this afternoon where we will go into details like, like this and examples like this. Thank you. Um, I'd like to go to the political side of things and ask it, what keeps you awake at night when you think about uh, cybersecurity from a, from a politician point of view? Well, keep me awake? No, I think uh, the most important thing is... People should be aware, aware what happens on the Internet, what happens when you don't protect yourself. And the funny thing is, in real life, we all know how to act. When we buy a car, we know we have to get a driver license. We know everything. But when we go on a digital highway, we just go there and have fun and are not aware that there is also a dark side on the Internet. So first thing, I had to have to agree awareness. So I, that keeps me really, really awake because in, in the Netherlands, 98% of the whole uh, Netherlands can be on the Internet. So you also have a responsibility for your people, but I think people also have a responsibility for that themselves. So that sometimes keeps me awake. So somebody has a question? Yes. Good, good, after, good morning. Uh, my name is Julia Morinets. I'm with the non-for-profit uh, tech together against Cybercrime International. So we do work in the field of cybercrime, cybersecurity, and uh, specifically on awareness raising campaigns. So my question would be, but how? <laughs> you know, how can we have an effective awareness raising campaign? And actually, um, I think the point is, um, even if citizens or users, they are aware, they don't know how to be assisted. How can we assist? Victims, they don't report. So my question would be, can this be part of the cybersecurity strategy? Do we need a cybersecurity strategy at national level? And how to do this? Thank you. Yes, thank you for the question. Um, my view would be start at the bottom. Start at school. Uh, the first graders start teaching uh, about the Internet. Uh, teach children well. That's my the uh, message I always have is teach your children well because there's a lot of bad stuff going on on the internet. We tell our kids not to go out and talk to people they don't know on the internet. They just chat with everybody. So that's a good. And if you don't know, you will you just go there and talk to everybody. But there are other things. There's uh, when internet started way 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 back. It was about uh, sharing information. These days, in, uh, Internet is about selling stuff. So all these 
there's always uh, there's also a, a trap in that because when there's money you can earn, then people will go there also bad people. So you have to be aware. But also companies have to be aware, the government has to be aware, and people have to be aware. So that's a, a, a good thing. Um, what was the question again? <laughs> Sorry. Because it's, it's about awareness. But yeah, mainly the second part of the question was, do we need to establish or to develop a cybersecurity strategy at national level so the awareness rating and what you just mentioned, the education measures, can be part of it? Because if not, if we don't have a strategy, at least for our point of view, how can we, you know, incorporate this? How can we organize this? So that's a question. Thank you. Yeah, well, Internet doesn't keep itself to borders, so it's not a national thing. It's an international, global thing. So we have to work together. And you see uh, with the search, the computer emergency rescue teams in Europe, they're now talking together, and you see it works. Because then you have short lines, and you can start uh, with the cyber security, because you talk to each other, and then... Uh, there's a, a, a bigger vision. And I think it has to be global, not Europe, not America or something global. We have to work together. So it's not a small, uh, a small issue, it's a big issue. And the funny thing is we don't look at it that way. I feel the whole NSA thing, people were all shocked, and then they went on like nothing ever happened. So... We have to make sure everybody understands what happens on the Internet. We also talked about uh, attacks, so uh, people who hack. We also have uh, people uh, who ethical hacking. I'm not sure if everybody understands. In Holland, we made, uh, the government made a, a responsible disclosure to protect people who have ethical uh, ways to hack. So you help each other. And maybe that's the way we should look at each other, not always at dangerous uh, things, but also at good things. And we should make each other stronger in less, unless, uh, instead of uh, weaken each other. So there's a lesson to learn for everybody, I guess. Work yeah. together and, well. It's an important message, I think. I think we have three national, uh, two national and one European strategy in the, in the making. I think Sylvia was... Was first. So, um, yeah, just to answer directly your question, uh, in Europe the answer has been yes, we thought we needed a cybersecurity strategy and so we devised a cybersecurity strategy. Um, it's a strategy that has different parts to it because we don't believe in the purely regulatory uh, approach to it. But when I was mentioning earlier the, the obligation for the key infrastructures to report on, on their cyber incidents, that would be a regulatory part to it. We have put up a public-private uh, partnership with, uh, with the other actors. And, of course, there's, uh, let's say, softer things like awareness raising and, and, uh, and of course, there's self-regulation from the industry who will have its own um, incentives in making sure that the data is protected. But I think for Europe, the answer is very clear. We thought we needed it. We got one. Okay. I have one question in the audience. Please introduce yourself. Thank you. Uh, Zai, Zai Jamil from the Developing Country Center on Cybercrime. I like the hacking for cash business, by the way. It's kind of interesting. <laughs> uh, a clarification on the south part, on the north part. By the way, you'd be surprised that there's actually the data between government and citizens is actually for sale in some countries in the south. So I want to flatten that debate a bit. But my question really was about the uh, things that you said about, you know, life, et cetera, that goes on. Uh, it, it seems a little interesting for me that the problem that you, whenever we, we were discussing where the problem is and what your concerns were, they were banking, stock exchange, health in these areas, which is sectoral. But the solution and response was general life, overall regulation. And I think that maybe we need to sort of balance out what we're trying to do. It makes sense to have sectoral regulation related to cybersecurity. So say, for instance, the banking sector has to respond or inform or there's, you know, uh, breach notifications for the stock exchanges, et cetera. That makes perfect sense. But it really makes me nervous when I hear that we need to, this is, uh, you know, the life now because it's on the Internet. All of it needs to be regulated. And I hope that's not the way we're going to go. If that was the case, if there was one global or, or large meta cybersecurity strategy, policy, regulation, whatever it was, 
guess what? That's exactly what Aparna was saying. They don't want people out there knowing exactly how they do things because the moment everybody knows what your cybersecurity strategy is or how you function, you become more vulnerable. And I think one of the things one would, I, would, I would sort of suggest is being more sectoral rather than being broadly general cybersecurity specific might be a better way to go. Thank you. Yeah. Sure. I, I'd also like to answer the question about um, uh, a national strategy and in the context of awareness. Um, the U.S. has had essentially two um, national strategies that attempted to do um, a, a categorization, a, co a compilation of the issues that um, uh, are encompassed by cybersecurity, which are fairly broad. Um, and uh, diverse, and and then put to, this, and then in our second time around, put together a put a framework around that that um, helped guide uh, an approach to cybersecurity, and an awareness campaign um, was certainly part of that. When when a nation puts forward a strategy of any kind, it raises it heightens the level of awareness nationally about that. Um, when we put out the, um, the strategy, it was done with a lot of consultation with uh, multi-stakeholder groups and civil society and industry and technical community and among the government entities as well. Um, and and it, so it reflects that input. The other thing I would say is that it's not exclusive um, you know, just because you say in a national strategy that an awareness campaign is important, which, which does help because it, it, it focuses the mind as to what's important to that country and what um, efforts might be able to be undertaken to help um, implement that strategy. But that's not the only thing that has to happen. It can be very grassroots and be very uh, uh, societal in a way. So it's, they're not mutually exclusive, but both very important. And I absolutely agree with the, com the comment that it's global. That also isn't mutually exclusive. Just because you have a national strategy that gives, your, uh, gives a framework to your national approach, and in our case, an international component is included in the international strategy, that's very, very important. And coordination and collaboration and partnerships and reaching out and trying to make um, the, the, put it in a global context is very important. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to take one last question on this topic and then move on to industry so, because they... Get the word also. Please introduce yourself. Uh, thank you very much. My name is Alan Cairns. I'm a member of the uh, UK Parliament. Uh, I've got no doubt that um, governments of, of all nations will understand the issues of uh, cybersecurity and the risks around it. But if I look to my colleagues, uh, and I even include myself uh, uh, in this, that the understanding of uh, parliamentarians of the risks is pretty limited. And therefore, the scrutiny over government cybersecurity policy is, pretty li is therefore limited because they're not questioning, they're not probing, and not prioritizing it as an issue. So when you know, we're in austere periods when, where there are budget cuts, uh, unless there are parliamentarians driving it as a priority, it doesn't tend to get the slice of money that it may well deserve. Um, and I think the original quote was, it's, uh, it's cheap to attack, but it's expensive to defend against. And therefore, what can we do to, in, to raise the level of debate and understanding amongst legislators who don't understand the technical risks? So that's a challenge for industry, I think. So who would like to respond? IETF, yes? Andrew? Um, uh, I think this is a really interesting question because you're quite right that a lot of the policy is being made in a technical vacuum. Uh, and, and in fact, some of this discussion has struck me as sort of funny because we keep talking about um, cybersecurity and I'm trying to figure out what are, you going, what are you being secure against. So I've got a list here. We've got bad guys. Um, we've got other random people on the, uh, on the internet, on your local network. We've got uh, foreign governments. Uh, we've ju got just random other users. We've got you know, people who pick up your um, little key that you happen to drop on the sidewalk. Um, what about your own government? What about your vendor? Uh, your vendor you, you know, can attack you, right, because they've got access to all your 
data. Uh, your own employees, you need to be secure against them, too, because they can walk out, uh, out, out the door. So there's, a, there's a, an enormous breadth of, of, these, uh, of the problems here, and actually they're different kinds of problems. So when you lump them together as cybersecurity, it's really easy to focus on one of those and, and not pay attention to the distinctions. One of the things we did um, uh, as, as sort of protocol designers, and I shouldn't include myself because this was before my time, but um, one of the things that happened with the internet design is that it, it's essentially a lab experiment that escaped and was successful, right? And so it wasn't really designed to be secure in the first place. And what we've been doing ever since then is kind of laying in extra security in various places. So there is a thing that governments can do that is not regulation, but that would be super helpful, and I strongly encourage you to think about doing this, and that is you can use your purchasing power to insist that vendors actually make the system secure from the ground up. So instead of having these systems that are designed and then you like kind of add some security later, which is this bolt-on component, and of course if you bolted it on, then somebody can come along and unbolt it. Um, instead, you can insist that the systems be secure from the ground up, and that means it's secure from you too. So what happens a lot of the time is that what people want is they want the system to be secure from other people, but they want their own access and they want to make sure that they've got their own back door. If there's a back door there, then somebody can walk through it, and that somebody may not be you, and that's actually a big part of the problem that we have right now. People are designing systems in order to respond to so-called security initiatives that are not security. They're, in fact, access um, initiatives. And I think that we need to pay an, a great deal of attention to the, the technical details, uh, to finally come back to this question, to the technical details that people are asking for. Uh, you know, what is it they're really asking for when they say, oh, I want this system designed this way or that way? So I think that the, the number one thing that I would say anyway as a protocol person is, First of all, I'm sorry we screwed up and we didn't design it so that, you know, there was um, perfect security all the way along. We're doing our part, for instance, at the IETF meeting in Vancouver uh, next week, uh, week after, whatever it is. Uh, you know, we're devoting a significant chunk of time to that with specific proposals to improve um, security in various ways. But this requires users, and one of the people who are big users and big consumers of this stuff are governments. You can do your part just by buying it. Well, that's an advice and a challenge, I think. Um, I've got one, some, somebody who wants to respond to that. Thank you. John LaPreeze, Northwestern University. And I'd just like to comment on the last speaker's uh, contribution that uh, I'm a historian of technology, and the U.S. government has been doing this for a long time, embedding contractual terms in its contracts to compel its vendors to embed certain technologies within its uh, services. And given the market power, at least within the domestic market in the U.S., that has major impacts on policy, not just within the government sector, but more broadly across the domestic sector. So this can have real impact across a nation and more widely. Thank you. As a question to the audience, people from governments who has actually know that they've negotiated security when they bought ICT, or do you just buy it off the shelf? Anybody who knows that there's been any negotiation security, hands please. Do you want this question to be responded to by governments? By, by governments first, because that was the challenge. From industry, anybody negotiates security by design when you buy ICT? Yes. So, for industry... I know. I know. I'll give you the mic. My name is Rolf Meijer. I'm from uh, the Netherlands uh, CCTLD.nl. And I know, but maybe my, my compatriots uh, from the government are not aware of that or they didn't want to mention it. But I know that uh, we have, I think it's like the gentleman over there suggested, that we have a list in the Netherlands which is called the Pas Toe of Leg Out List, um, in which government uh, puts um, um, certain conditions on which if they uh, put out a bid uh, for, for tender, um, the supplier will have to uh, follow those uh, criteria. And we managed to get DNSSEC on that list. So it's a good example, I think, of a security specification that the government uses in their tenders. Thank you for the example. Um, we already mentioned the IETF just now, Andrew. Um, perhaps not everybody knows exactly what the IETF does, what it stands for. 
So, but it's something like self-regulation, right? Uh, so the IETF stands for the Internet Engineering Task Force, and, and, and I need to uh, be very careful here. Um, I don't speak for the IETF, and if you ever went to an IETF meeting, you would know why, um, because herding cats barely describes what we do. Um, uh, it, it's, it's much more chaotic than that. But, um, uh, but, but one of the things we do is, is we are a, a group of people who come together, and anybody can, can join. You can, you can show up on the mailing list, and that's really all it takes. Uh, and contribute to these, uh, these standards. All of the stuff that you use on the Internet, all of the protocols that make things go, all of the things that allow us to uh, send these bits around, they're all IETF, um, with a couple of exceptions, they're all IETF um, standards. And these standards are developed in public, in the open, uh, in a, um, uh, a rough consensus model so that anybody can read it, anybody can read the documents, anybody can comment. And what we do is we work towards the best technical solution as far as we understand it. Um, that, that isn't to say we always get it right. For instance, we didn't think that pervasive monitoring was going to be a problem, so we didn't include that in our threat model. That was a mistake. Um, but, you know, we, we, we didn't do that. We didn't do opportunistic encryption because we thought that was too dangerous. Well, it turns out maybe it was a good idea. So there are, there are cases where we get it wrong. Nevertheless, the, um, the overall structure is a way in which different people come together and everybody is working towards this common goal of making the systems work in the technically best way that we know how to do. Uh, it is a completely open process, and so it's a little chaotic. And, and if you want to come and, and join a meeting, of course, I would encourage you to do so, but be prepared um, because it's, it's not formal like this. Uh, so it, it can be a little alarming, um, but we're, we're actually friendly. It's just that we're really vicious about it. As a response to that, um, we had the same session, uh, you should know, in the Netherlands three weeks ago with Dutch participants. And there was somebody from the Dutch government in the audience, and I knew he had been to his first IGF in Berlin. And I just walked up to him and asked him, what do you think? Did, did you feel welcome? Did you understand what was going on? And he said, well, I was sort of left on my own, and nobody approached me at first, so I went out talking to people. But it is an example that somebody from government goes to the IGF and then doesn't know where to start. Is that something that could be improved over, over time? Lesson learned. It, it is something that could be improved. Uh, one thing I, I would say is that there are sessions outside of the official sessions. So we're not very good at, at this kind of stuff because we're geeks, right? You know, you know the... <laughs> You know, you know the story, right, about, about the, uh, the extrovert geek is the one that looks at your shoes. Um, so so there's, there's a certain amount of this that is, is just a cultural problem. But we'll say uh, that, that there are sessions, for instance, on Sunday that are, are, are endeavor, they endeavor to welcome people in. Um, it, it's like any other kind of group that works a lot together, right? It, it, it's difficult to get in. It's hard for me, for instance, to get into um, into this community a little bit because I spend most of my time in the geek land. So it's the same sort of problem, um, but but some of us are welcoming. And, you know, if you have any any other things that you want to uh, ask about or if you're coming to Vancouver or another future meeting, uh, you know, obviously I will be there and you should uh, feel free to, uh, you know, tap me on the shoulder and say, hey, I heard you before and, and you don't seem that scary. So I'll, maybe I do, but I, I intend not to be. Have you ever have you ever come to know? Have you ever met the people at the table here, not necessarily personally, but their colleagues? Uh, well, not before we walked in the room. So no, no Brazilian government ever, and the European Commission, the U.S. government. Um, so so I, I know so people from I know personally. people from those uh, from those uh, those bodies, um, you know, in various places. But typically, you know, they're people from from the from the back office, right? It's, it, it, it is a very technical environment. We're not talking about governance. What we're trying to do is build the pieces that allow this stuff to happen. We don't do policy. The goal is to do the protocols. But, of course, there are choices. There are policy things that are either enabled or not enabled by the protocols that you build. And sometimes we don't think about um, these angles. And sometimes we do and we think, oh, it doesn't really matter. And, and some of the time, you know, we're enabling these, uh, these, these various behaviors. And one could argue, well, that's not a completely neutral thing to be doing. But I think the IETF tries to take the stance that we're not in, we're not in the business of telling you how to run your network. That does mean, of course, that the network has capabilities on it that we're 
personally, many of us are not comfortable with. But that is part of our job. Our professional responsibility is to make the, the system technically strong and allow you know, the range of policy choices that we think people might want to have. That doesn't mean that I think all of those policy choices are a good one, but that's not my job when I'm doing my protocol work. I'm putting you on the spot here. Had you ever heard of the ITF, yes or no? Oh, yes. yes, I'm a professor. So I'm a computer science professor. I have heard about IETF. Uh, I would like to, to make a final comment about what we have been discussing here. Uh, I have, your, regarding your question about uh, uh, cybersecurity strategy, one comment that I have is that most of the strategies, uh, they address past threats. They do not look into future problems. Let me give you a clear example. Uh, when we talk about Internet of Things, nobody mentioned that here. They will be a, 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 a big. They will mean a big uh, 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 increase in the risk for the population, because we are not talking about hacking information, but we are talking about hacking real actions on your vehicle, on your home. So uh, I think that a message that I would like to to leave here as government is that we should look more into the future for those threats. So, so, if I can sum it up, it may be that some topics which are genuine concerns should reach people from the IETF and maybe not just from industry but also from government. So, should there be something like a gag to the IETF? I'm saying something very sensitive here, I know. But well, something in which you, you meet and discuss these sort of topics. Uh, well, uh, it isn't a GAC that you need, right? What you need to do is show up and participate. And, and we do have, I mean, a good example, for instance, is, is, is the U.S. NIST, the, the National Institutes for Science and Technology. Did I expand that right? Um, uh, so I have colleagues there, for instance, who participate in these things, and they participate pr precisely because they want the standards to be good. Um, so so th that's the way to do it. And, and one thing, of course, that governments can do under those circumstances is say, hey, this is enough of a priority that we will have people who will work on those things and will actually contribute to those things and will review the documents. I've I got to tell you, it is scut work um, building, that, building this, this stuff. You've got to read endless versions of the draft and then, and then negotiate about, you know, well, no, I think that it has this attack or I think it has this problem and so on. It's a lot of work. And, and that requires people who are going to do that work, and it's a hard job to find those, those, those reviewers. I, mean, I, th I think that's an open invitation, right? So that's, I think, a major outcome of this session. Apinar. Um, yeah, I just wanted to add, I know the Internet Society, and maybe Karen Mulberry can talk a little bit more about this, has a program that essentially helps countries with you know, regulatory officials attend the IETF and sort of provides an introduction to what can seem like a complicated process. I, I don't know if Karen wants to say more about that, but I think it's an important resource and one that could be more utilized. Would you like to respond, Karen? Please introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Karen Mulberry. I'm with the Internet Society. And indeed, we sponsor a, a, um, a fellowship program for policymakers. Um, and we've got a lot of support from a variety of organizations to do this so that governments and, and industry, um, you know, policymakers can attend and, and participate in the IETF process. This is truly the multi-stakeholder dialogue where individuals show up and contribute and, 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 and try to move things forward in terms of development of initiatives on the Internet. So we bring policymakers in. We try to shepherd them through the process. Uh, we don't totally hold their hands 100% um, of the time because they need to experience this individually as well. But we try to provide some context and framework for how the IETF operates, what it's focusing uh, on and at various sessions, and, and so they can be exposed to this because it's important that they understand how the collaborative effect um, occurs in this open dialogue. I do know, too, that the IETF has recently formed a, a policy discussion list because they're very interested in trying, you know, for the, for the geeks and the, and the techie people, trying to understand the, the policy perspectives on things. Because, you know, as engineers, you can, you know, you're driven to, to collaborate and, and, and develop solutions to things. 
with the, you know, the, the context of policy and other things may not be part of the dialogue and, and when you look at the perspective for, of a collaborative solution. So they're trying to bring a little bit more understanding from the policy side, things that they ought to be aware of as they work towards pro providing those collaborative solutions. And, and by the way, if there's any governments in here that are interested in the, in the fellowship program, please see me and I'll see what I can do to arrange to have you participate in an in IETF meeting. Another invitation. Very good. I think that we have some questions from the room. We have a remote one. We'll do the remote one first. Okay. okay. Thank you. We have a question from Venezuela from Jorge Gonzalez at the Public University Udo who asks, what can be done to prevent governments from committing excesses with the excuses of cybersecurity? Who wants to take that one? Yes? Virginia, please. Oh, I think that if we, if we uh, uh, take into consideration the uh, multi-stakeholder models, they can help to, to give a balance to, to, to government proposals. Nina? If I may just add to that, I think it's about checks and balances, the framework that's in place. So whenever you're think, considering any uh, security proposal, uh, take it in a multi-stakeholder fashion. Do have discussions with uh, several interested parties at the table and do it in a transparent way. Um, I think that should be at least a guiding principle when you're discussing security measures and use of data. Thank you. Please introduce yourself. Yeah, hello, my name is Athena Fraguli and I'm from the RIPEN CC. Um, so we understand that cyber security is nothing new and uh, it's, a, it's a, a, a problem, let's say, the technical community has identified. Uh, it's been some, some, some years now. and. Um, so it has been discussed in open fora and uh, through self-regulated initiatives and we heard about the IETF discussions. There have been uh, some proposed solutions such as the RPKI, the NSEC and so on. And we also hear from the Commission uh, that uh, they have come up with a strategy which is very much appreciated. They also um, uh, introduced this platform for a discussion between uh, public and private sector. And I was wondering uh, whether the Commission is also uh, uh, has um, thought of uh, the possibility to cooperate with this already existing fora for standards, whether they will take these standards into account, whether uh, they will refer to these standards into uh, these this bodies, these self-regulating bodies in the strategy. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for your question. Um, on standards, uh, what I, I think the answer is yes. I mean, I don't deal directly with. I'm, you know, it's my colleagues who, who deal with the uh, with the platform. Um, one thing I can say is that it's not part of our strategy to mandate any specific standards. So the, the commission would not, you know, kind of get up there and, and start mandating standards. There, we re we absolutely recognize our limits as policymakers and, and not technicians. So I think the, the dialogue is open and on standards uh, also that we would not be imposing any type of standards. I don't think that fully answers your question, but I'm happy bilaterally to put you in touch with the right people. Uh, one problem that the, um, that the IETF standards have is that um, there are a number of governments who refuse to refer to them as standards. Um, who, who accept only standards that are promulgated by particular agencies that they recognize, and these are typically treaty organizations. Um, that's a problem because those are typically not the places where the standards are actually developed. One of the really cool things about the Internet and what has made it so successful is, is the kind of you know, permissionless inter innovation that is part of it. That is, it, the, the innovation happens at the edges. Uh, and, and that's why... Uh, we have all of the good things that we do on the Internet because it's easy for somebody to pick it up. You don't have to upgrade the entire network in order for something to happen. But 
but that kind of environment really only lends itself to uh, to the kinds of standards that we're able to develop in the IETF because it's the people who are participating who are interested in it, right? Um, the kind of heavyweight centralized standards development that is effective for other kinds of telecommunication devices frequently is not that it's not interested in the kinds of standards that we're developing at the IETF. We collaborate with those bodies and we're happy to, but there are different kinds of spheres and there are different kinds of interests. So it would be very helpful for governments and for regulators to say, oh yeah, you, we're going to embrace the RFC series as well as one of our significant sources of standards and, and to promulgate those and include them in purchasing decisions and so on. Well, the, the, that's one of the questions we actually have on the list, so let's go there first and I'll come back to you in a moment. Um, a lot of the standards apparently are not adopted or not implemented by, by companies that maybe should be doing so or at least is voluntary. But if we're talking cybersecurity, it may be in the interest of a national, national government to have them implemented somehow. So is there a way that when they know that those standards are there and that they are important to create some sort of a level playing field to actually assist with having them adopted within a certain period of, uh, period of time? Or would that not be the right way forward from, from a government point of view and from industry point of view, please? Okay. I'll be so I think we want to be really careful about mandating standards in a legislative or regulatory process. And I'll just give you two examples. Um, in 1996, the U.S. Congress passed the most recent iteration of a revision of the Telecoms Act. Um, the prior sort of full uh, writing of the act had been in 1934. And between, and the, most accounts will say that it took roughly 10 years to get the 96 Act off the ground. So people started talking about it roughly in 1984, 85, along the time that the Cable Act was adopted. So that talks, that's talking about 10 years for the revision of an act, not uh, a creation of a new act out of whole cloth. Uh, similarly, the, the rulemaking process in the states, which is somewhat faster than the regulatory process, is, is not what you would call truly fast. Rulemakings last a number of years. They get tied up in litigation. could be four, five, six years before a rule is finally settled. Um, what we see in the standard setting contest is a context is a world that evolves much more quickly, and more importantly, what we see in the context of cybersecurity attacks is attackers that are much, much, much more nimble. Um, and so if we get into a situation where we're waiting 10 years to adopt or implement or require standards, the standards we will require will be hopelessly outdated and merely hamper companies in being able to effectively respond to current attacks. Um, since we're talking about this in this context, I'd like to take the opportunity to refer to um, President Obama's executive order that he issued in February of this year. Um, it does a couple of things, but one thing in this context it does is to direct our National Institutes of Standards and Technology that Andrew referred to earlier to lead the development, and that goes back to the convening uh, role I mentioned earlier for government, um, to reduce cyber risks to critical infrastructure. So working with industry, NIST will um, work to identifying existing voluntary standards, such as those we're talking about and possibly others, um, and, and industry best practices into the framework. And then um, utilize uh, uh, man all manner of uh, communication and incentives and convening functions to help encourage adoption of those standards and, um, and best practices by all in the community. The no idea is not for the framework to dictate a one-size-fits-all technological school solution precisely to the points that Parna raised, um, but instead to promote a collaborative approach to encouraging innovation, recognizing that there are different needs by all of the actors. One critical infrastructure is not another, one person's critical infrastructure entity is not another person's critical infrastructure entity. And so we really need to recognize that there are those differences and different differences in needs and challenges. Um, so I, I, um, I commend you with the information about this, uh, this cybersecurity framework. Um, we have, it has been a very uh, robust multi-stakeholder approach of, of, of 
of soliciting input and participation by industry, um, but also by industry um, and other um, players from around the world too. So if there's an interest in providing input in that, we can we can certainly make that available too. Thank you. And when all else fails, you've tried everything and everyone agrees it's important and it's just not happening for whatever reason. What happens then? I, I really want to challenge this idea that everyone agrees that it's important and nobody's using it. Yeah. If, if, if people aren't using it, they don't think it's that important. Um, but if you think that something is really important and you think that it's not getting implemented and you're a government and you're buying you know, a trillion dollars worth of IT this, this year, you've got a tremendous opportunity to make that thing, that, that thing implemented. I'll tell you what, if, if somebody comes to me with this year's you know, purchase order and say, I want to spend $3 million on this technology, will you make it happen? I've suddenly got a much more powerful you know, argument to make to my bosses in product development, right? I've got this sale here right now, let's build it. Um, so, so that's a really, really important incentive, and it's one of, the, one of the biggest levers that governments have because every government is an enormous consumer of these, of these things. Um, and, and that's really how the, how the Internet itself got built, right? There was an interest on the part of the Department of Defense and, and the Advanced Research Projects Agency and so on to have this thing and to build the experiments and so on, so that's how it got funded. And that's the reason we've got this good thing here today. So it, it's always been a partnership with governments always being involved. And it, it, it is crazy to talk about this being either government or no government. But it's, it's important to recognize that the way the government acts in here is primarily by being an actor rather than by being a regulator. I think that, that it's much more effective in that case. So by example also, paraphrasing. Yeah, I I I I just like to agree with you on that, and I think there's 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 two things I want to say. First, um, indeed, it's it's up to government can set an example when it when it, it procures its own uh, its own IT systems, and actually that um, last two years ago the European Commission put out there um, some legislation that allows in public procurement for referencing of standards that are outside of the official standardization body. So actually we've, we've been recognizing this for some time and, and, uh, and, and we've, we've put it into practice. And we do come to the IETF. Thank you. Uh, in our case in Brazil, also a gov government procurement is an important tool to, to, to uh, demand certain types of standards. It, it's really, it has been used for that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Narani Puna. I work for Netnode. We're a technical internet infrastructure organization based in Sweden. We run exchange points and we also manage one of the 13 DNS root name servers. And that means we get pulled into both the work of the IETF and the work here. So it means that I go to IETF meetings, I go to ICANN meetings, I go to regional internet registry meetings, and I go to these, and I never feel comfortable at any of them. I don't know what that says about my relationship to shoes, but um, <laughs> what I want to say, though, is that, um, well, first of all, uh, so, so there are people from the IETF here. Andrew is not the only one. And like he says, there's no king of the IETF who, who comes here to speak it to you. And there have been people from the IETF, the, the, the IGFs previously as well. And I do think, what, I, I really do think that it's, it's good to have an increased exchange um, of, of, uh, of information between the two. It doesn't mean that governments should go and sit in the internet standards working groups and, and discuss whether this flag should be on or off. But, but there needs to be an increased communication. And while I think the ITF, you know, is doing things to, to try to welcome policymakers into to sort of its sphere, I also think the IGF could do a little bit more to, to, to welcome the geeks into to this community because we do need those voices. And while, while it's inter entertaining to talk about, you know, security, cybersecurity, good or bad, for or against, self-regulation or no regulation, only regulation, I think it's actually 
Sometimes it's not very useful to talk about security as if, as if it's just one thing. You're just lumping a whole lot of different issues into one bucket. And um, it also kind of disregards this, this kind of the ecosystem we're in with all the different multi -stake all the different stakeholders. So I think it would be more useful to, to it'd be interesting to hear specific examples of where different multi stakeholders have, have cooperated to solve specific issues within sort of this cybersecurity bucket. Thank you. Nina, would you like to address that? Yes, thanks. Um, well, what we, what we did after our first national cybersecurity strategy in the Netherlands about two years ago, we built quite a lot of structures and institutions to at least uh, get a, a sense or make it open for uh, organizations, multi-stakeholders to participate. So if you, if you for example, need a, or a specific example, we have uh, the National Cybersecurity Center now, which is uh, developed from the GovCert into a national cert, but has this flexible pool of uh, liaisons from private sector, from academia, um, from other international, or, uh, from other national organizations, public organizations, private, um, and they are connected to the in information sharing and analysis centers of different critical sectors, the ISACs. Uh, the National Cybersecurity Center holds a secretariat, so they are providing this, this form, this platform for a sector to yeah, consult together on, on security issues to share the best practices. Some sectors have developed their ISEC, mu ISEC much more already than others. We're still forming about two new ones uh, on transport, and um, I believe there's one on, on, the, on the ports, I'm not sure. Um, so this is one of the concrete examples that our National Cybersecurity Center uses. Then there's also privately driven initiatives. Um, there is the Abuse Hub or Abuse Information Exchange. It's an initiative that was subsidized in the beginning by the, the Ministry of Economic Affairs. But, well, there are some people in the room that may actually have much more information on that. But it's something where we as government are trying to uh, 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 create our relationship with that uh, private sector on specific uh, bob that information uh, initiatives like that. Yeah. We have another remote uh, participant. After that, we're going to go into the final closing because we are running out of time. If you don't mind, we're going to go a few minutes over time, but after that, everybody can go to lunch. So one more remote participant. So we just got in a comment from Holland, and it says, I disagree with the Dutch panelists that following the NSA revel revelations that life went on as usual. I think this is possibly naive and dismissive of the awareness. I say healthy paranoia that the revelations have helped to develop. I believe this will add to greater self-governance as well as be a component in organization security planning, consciously, subconsciously, or otherwise. And one more comment just from Belgium that just came in that says, I want to know why there is no discussion of vulnerability regulation. Surely software security is the biggest problem. Regulation of vulnerability disclosure is far more important than regulation of breaches. What about zero day regulation and forever day regulation? Zero day and forever days are the biggest threats to our security. If the vulnerability did not exist, the attacks could not happen. Panelists seem to be sidestepping the issue. Question for, uh, I, think, I think it was for, I'm losing my mind here. It's for, for, for you, sorry, I'll sit. Yeah. And it's a question for you, Sylvia, I think. <laughs> so you, for, you first. Huh? On the NSA uh, um, yeah, vulnerable. But what was the question? It was more the, a comment, but... The question was that well, that sort of was a bit naive that is to say that it just went away, the NSA, and that uh, there's no, a lot of actions going on about well, it. Well, that's not what I said. I said uh, there was this whole NSA issue, and then uh, people just uh, went on with their lives. That's what I said. And what you need is, is people have to make sure that what happened with the NSA to make sure uh, uh, to be aware what's going on on the internet. So when you, uh, uh, everything you say on the internet can be read by other people. Uh, if your uh, PC is not, uh, uh, you, uh, secured. secured, then there's a, 
it's not only the NSA, it's the whole world who can read on, uh, with you on your PC. It's your, uh, uh, your PC can be used in a, uh, in a botnet. If you don't understand how your PC is working, that was my message more. You, if you don't understand how things work, uh, but you are also part of it, so you should be sure you, uh, you understand how it works. So that was more my uh, message. And I also wanted to react on the, uh, me, uh, uh, from England. Because it's true, uh, in government and the politicians, they have to make sure they, they make uh, agreements, but they don't understand how it works. So there's a lesson to learn. And I think in Holland we have a lot of organizations who uh, talk to poli uh, politicians. They try to explain, we have round table sessions, so that's a good thing too. We have to learn from each other, so that's a, maybe in other governments they should try to, to talk to uh, people like uh, Bits of Freedom who can explain things to you. So maybe that's uh, also a good message. So, so also, if you have a home, you secure it yourself by locking the door. If you drive a car, you know how to do that and take some responsibility for your environment. But on the internet, when we go on there, we do not perhaps all do that yet. That's, I think, a paradox. Yeah, that was the message I was trying to send, not well. that we, yeah, that's what we should be aware. That's the main that's message for me. That's also an outcome that it's also not only the governments or the industry can do something, in the end it's the end user also. Sylvia, on the comments on why yeah. are the, the software vendors not included in, in any regulation that is envisioned? I, uh, I, I just wanted to, to clarify that as far as the Commission proposals, as far as this directive is concerned, this piece of legislation, we are actually focusing on reporting. We are not focusing so much into uh, seeing uh, what is wrong in the system, but in reporting. Now, one of the areas that is included in our, in our directive are uh, the key Internet companies, including large cloud providers, social networks, e-commerce platforms and search engines. So I think that might actually, I don't know if that was the question that, that, that uh, was being uh, posed by Belgium, but we are covering those areas. But again, this is about reporting. I mean, the, the, no, um, no government is in a position to go and see what's wrong in the system. That's, that's really not our job. Okay, thank you. I'm going to do one, one last question. I'm sorry, we, we are running out of time. I know we have a lot of questions and comments, but I'm going to take the last question myself, and then we go into the recommendations. Otherwise, you miss lunch. Unless you say we go on for half an hour and skip half an hour lunch, but the choice is yours, or you have other meetings. It's, so, so, so there's another thing we have to stop. So I have one more question, and then we go to the recommendations. Um, from, from the wicked in, in the, 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 I don't know what it stands for, but most people know. But uh, what I understand is that, that there was some sort of a, if you paraphrase the help question there from, from all these things on the internet usually go on in the West and all these Western companies that have money enough go there. And basically people also feel left behind and have, have an assistant question. How, so how can we make sure that the MOOC, the Message and Abuse Working Group, or the IETF, or other self-regulatory bodies also include people that maybe have questions that are not heard properly at the moment. So are there suggestions how to actually reach out better, perhaps, into the developing world? I wasn't sure where you were going with that question, Walt, but <laughs> I'm, um, I'm, I'm happy where it ended up because what I'd really like to say is that I think there are a lot of efforts uh, that are ongoing and that can be enhanced in the, in the area of capacity building for all of these areas. And, and not that I wouldn't necessarily say that developing countries might not need to go to ITF because I think they should, but there's also other ways to help build capacity in these areas, help uh, with um, information exchange training uh, opportunities. So there are lots of, opportuni lots of um, options for that kind of uh, um, uh, pro programming. Um, the U.S. is certainly taking a, uh, um, 
bigger effort in this area. We've had several cybersecurity and cybercrime training workshops in the developing world, and we're working with many others um, to, to find ways to help do that. Um, we're working in the, the our region to help bring capacity building um, efforts into uh, regional, uh, regional efforts, such as OAS. Uh, or CTEL. Um, so I encourage those that feel that they might um, need to participate in some of these other structures or need to learn more to reach out and ask for it. Thank you. Yeah, I, I just wanted to, uh, you know, maybe tell the, the audience, some of, the, of you may be uh, aware already, the, the Commission, together with other partners, and most notably Brazil, is uh, uh, working on uh, uh, launching a global Internet policy observatory. This is a tool that uh, we are at the moment just studying the feasibility of, but it is a tool that would um, online provide all kinds of information and uh, a platform for exchange on a variety of, of ongoing um, processes at, in, the, in the Internet governance level, and it's exactly meant to reach out to, uh, to developing countries or to countries that in any case wouldn't have maybe all the resources to be able to, to participate in the process uh, fully. And uh, it, is, it is something, it's, it, we've ca we call it the JIPO for now, it's something which is not at all Western. I think we have uh, some African partners in there, we have uh, civil society in there. So that's uh, just a tool, but something that could help. Mm -hmm. Andrew? Uh, on the standards development side, um, first of all, I want to concede something. The IETF is overwhelmingly populated by fat middle-aged men uh, with, um, you know, middle-class engineering jobs from uh, North America, Europe, and uh, um, mostly that. There's, there's a significant population from Japan. There's a very significant population from China. Um, uh, it's also true that we perform our, our work primarily in English, which is a significant disadvantage for people for whom English is a second language. Um, the English uh, problem, is, I'm going to separate these two because the, the, the common language problem, it, it turns out you just need one, right? You can't do it in everything because you're, you're building a standard and so you need to have exactly one language because you need to have exactly one thing that it means because these things have to interoperate. Um, we picked English, I think, just by historical accident. That doesn't mean that it will be English forever, um, but it is English right now. However, um, despite the fat middle-aged men problem, um, uh, it, it's, it's also true that we're working rather hard to do something about that. Um, so we, uh, we do encourage um, uh, you know, people who are not um, from, from industry, we, we try pretty hard. Uh, it's difficult because you know, we have these meetings and, and you go in one place and you've got to travel to the meeting. But you don't have to travel to the meeting. One of the key things is that it is hard, but it is not impossible to get work done in the IETF exclusively by the mailing list. Uh, I do have a co-chair of a working group that, uh, that is winding down now uh, who is from Mauritius, and he has not come to all of the meetings. Sometimes we've done it remotely. He has participated remotely, and I've been in the room or something. So we, we do work at that. It means that if you are participating in that mode, you've got to um, work harder. But, uh, you know, there, there's, there's just a fact that it's harder, I think, also for remote participants here if they're in North America right now, right? It's, it's the opposite side of the world, and so they're up in the middle of the night. And I think that that's just always going to be true in a global development uh, organization. So, so there's going to be some cost on all sides, but I, I do believe, uh, at least in the case of the IETF, that, that as a community we're taking this quite seriously and, and that, that diversity problem is not only um, you know, um, different parts of the world, but also different genders, different ages, uh, different economic circumstances. There's a number of, of um, dimensions. Thank you very much. We're going to move to the last part of our panel. I've asked everybody to give personal or from their affiliation a recommendation for topics that could be discussed in other fora in the next year or two years or perhaps at the next IGF, a topic we should delve deeper into. So we'll start with you, Virgilio. Well, I'm, I'm going to conclude uh, emphasizing the importance of the mode stakeholder governance models to increase cybersecurity in developing, the developing countries, 
in Brazil, we have uh, uh, observed the importance of these models. For instance, in uh, cybersecurity awareness programs, the, the presence of non-governmental organizations, NGOs, and private companies uh, is very important to disseminate the word and the knowledge about cybersecurity. So, again, to emphasize the importance of that. And the examples that we had in Brazil uh, with almost 20 years of, of a multi-stakeholder uh, model, uh, the results concerning cybersecurity have, have been very positive. So I would like to... I think a better reason the answer. So that's I'm conclu concluding with that. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, maybe for the work ahead, I think we should uh, uh, evaluate the discuss the let's say the public-private platforms and see if they're if they're you know if they're doing their job properly, and that's something we could maybe look at in the future. Uh, I'm, I'm loath to make predictions uh, a year out because um, you know the internet moves around so fast that it's difficult. But one thing that I would say is is I believe the the collaboration. Uh, among the various stakeholders, and, and you know, technical people are only one of those, uh, is, is is something that I think I, I think ought to be encouraged. I've, I've noticed over the past year uh, some some additional bridge building between sort of policymakers and 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 technical community people, and I I hope that that will continue because I think that it's one of the most valuable trends that we can we can encourage. Thank you, Andrew. Lisa. Uh, I'm, I'm going to say that I think um, I would like to propose that we don't wait until the next IGF say to to um, have the next discussion. Um, you know, the preparation for the IGF is kind of a long, year-long process, and it starts in February. And so I would encourage anybody that may want to provide input into what might be discussed next year to start then. Start thinking now about what what questions we didn't answer, what questions aren't answered for you in the, in the course of the week, who you might want to try to, to um, meet with if you haven't been able to do that now. Because that, the, work, the way the workshops are built up, the way the topics are built up, that starts really early. So I, I guess I encourage everyone to think about that now and provide input um, into the website, into working with others, whatever way that we can do that, because that's part of the robustness of this, this forum. Thank you. Yeah, well, uh, I keep repeating myself, but I would say uh, raise awareness, look at it global, not only local or in your own small way, and take responsibility as a user, as a company, as a government. So that would be my message. Um, I think we just need to continue keeping to build trust by sharing uh, information, sharing your uh, knowing each other, um, is being transparent on your interests, on objectives, um, sharing your experiences, sharing your mistakes, and just start talking the same language. We do that in several ways, the multi-stakeholder models, the public-private partnerships, we call it, or we, we're starting to move more into public-private participation, acting rather than just talking. Um, but I, it, my, mes my main message would just be keep, keep sharing that. Um, talk the same language. This summer, our National Cybersecurity uh, Center and our policy department actually moved in together within the ministry. And I can tell you that never before I actually enjoyed, liked to get a sticker in my goodie bag before. So I guess that's starting to, to connect that policy level to the text. I think one key thing to focus on in the coming year and something we might reflect upon a year from now is how do we do a better job of building capacity around cybersecurity issues in emerging markets. Um, this is a rather uh, northern heavy panel and I think we have some work to do and some outreach to do to sort of share best practices, answer questions and develop a set of strategies that make sense for those markets and those communities. Thank you very much. I won't start apologizing for the Northern Hemisphere, but that's the way it wound up. Um, I want to take a big hand 
through our panelists, our remote uh, people, and the scribes of this session. So th thank you very much. And to wind up, I also want to thank you for actively participating, and I apologize that not everybody could have all questions answered, but I hope that uh, there's enough to discuss afterwards when we go to lunch. So thank you.